basically. Just as okay. So thank you, Alison, again for volunteering for pre to present in this this in very interesting paper. So yeah, thank you, and yeah, the floor is yours. Great, thanks. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so the the paper that um, we chose for for this week, um, you can see my slides again, right? Yes, we do. Right, great. Um, it's called Integrated Information as a Common Signature of Dynamical and Information Processing Complexity. Um, so that's a lot, um, but really the paper, um, I'll kind of break it down into to its several components um, during this during this presentation. Um, so just as a little bit of an outline, uh, I'm going to kind of go through some of this a little bit non-linearly. Um, first, I'll actually talk about what is integrated information, um, at least what is integrated information from the perspective of this particular paper. Um, and then I'm going to go back and provide a little bit of background on integrated information theory and how it got started as a theory of consciousness and how that's kind of been a it's been sort of a popular and widely adopted concept in neuroscience, it seems, but it's also been pretty controversial at the same time. Um, so it's got some philosophical and, and practical um, controversy associated with, with the measure as consciousness. Um, and then I'm gonna backpedal back to this paper and talk about um, the particular studies that they bring up here and they kind of, um, they use the words pragmatic and demystifying um, pretty often because they're kind of trying to take it away from the theory of consciousness concept and just look at these, look at this measure as an information theory measure um, and apply it to different types of systems. Um, so a little bit ahead of time, I'm sorry if this is not a really well organized presentation. Um, it kind of got put together really haphazardly because um, this is an actual photo of my family in the past few few weeks, um, everyone has had just rotating cycles of daycare illnesses. So I'll let you pick out which one is which of us. Um, but that's kind of a, that's our current situation. Um, so it's a little bit um, haphazard maybe. So sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so um, first I'll kind of dive into what this measure of integrated information actually is. Um, so the general idea is that we have a system, it's called X, and X is actually many interrelated nodes. So X is X1, 2, 3, 4, um, A, B, C, D. Um, so we kind of have a group of interacting nodes. Um, I think of these automatically as sort of time series variables, um, but it also could be like a graphical network where you have like a cause and effect type of, um, type of graph. Um, and then we can find the mutual information between the lagged and current values of the entire system. Um, so this just looks like mutual information between the some past time step tau and the present value. Um, but remember that X is actually the whole system. Um, so we're actually finding the mutual information between all the past values and all the current values of the system. Um, then um, what we can do is bipartition the nodes into two subsets. So this is the illustration that is provided in the paper um, where say you have five nodes and you can partition those nodes into groups in a bunch of different ways. Um, then we can find the mutual information within each subset. So we're calling the subsets M1 and M2 and we're just doing the same mutual information, but just within each subset and adding them together. Um, so this is where you can start kind of seeing the idea of the the whole being this this oh, where's my mouse this value of mutual information, and then the the sum of the parts is is this bipartitioning. Um, and then we subtract them. So this little little phi measure is. Um, the total mutual information minus that, um, oh, this should be, there should be a parentheses right there because we're subtracting this, um, these two terms. Um, so it's the total mutual information minus the sum of one of the bipartitions. And we do this over and over for all the possible bipartitions. So we take the cruelest cut is what they call it of integrated information. 
Um, so the minimum information by partition is whichever of these by partitionings leads to the smallest value of, of little fee um, gets to be called big fee. Um, so that's integrated information in a nutshell. It's um, the it's the subtraction of the mutual information between the parts from the whole, um, and it's the smallest value given a bunch of different cuts. Um, so I have a question here, Alice. Sure. So it's quite possible that one of those nodes is not contributing anything. So the smallest could actually be zero if you if you just allow the network to be anything you want, right? That that sort of a little confused me a little bit when I was yesterday. Why would you take the minimum unless all of them are actually actively contributing? Uh, you could end up with this pathological situation. Did you think about that? Um, yeah, so, so yeah, I, I've not gone very deep into to that part, but yeah, if, if you did have a node that was kind of accidentally put in there, like it's just random non-contributing, um, I, I think what would happen is that would it would get lumped in with another one of the bipartitions. So, so it would it would get lumped in in one of the bipartitions. Um, but but that is one thing about this measure is that it can be negative. Um, so you could very well have a case where that I, this, this term here could be negative. Um, you could have a random node that is its own bipartition. So it's, it's, it's like this case here maybe, but it's disconnected. Um, but maybe its past predicts its future. So this number could be large. Um, and this number could still also be large because it's the rest of the network. Um, so. Oh, it's the past predicting the future. Okay, yeah. I didn't quite catch that. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so there, there is kind of a, a question of like the decisions of what nodes to include. Um, so, if you had a really large data set, and you know, you get very different values of this if you took away one node potentially. Um, but also potentially it's a system wide, it's a system wide measure. So it's, it's not even considering sources and targets, which is kind of the hard thing for me to get around. It's there, there is no target node, um, which is how I usually think about information theory measures of, you know, the past of Z is predicting the future of X. Um, but this is the past of the entire network predicting the future of the entire network, um, okay. which is a little bit different. Um, and there's there's also some weighting going on that I, I didn't go into the details of. So they they weight it such that one single node bipartitions are not encouraged. So so the most most likely bipartition is actually like more towards equally sized bipartitions. Um, was that in this paper? Sure. I didn't see that. That was in this paper, yeah. Um, there's like a K, like a K value that was like a normalization coefficient. Um, that it, it was something to do with the entropy. It was something to do with the like normalizing by the joint entropy of the partitions. Something, something about that. Um, I'll take a look. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good, a good question. There, there's a little bit more um, going on in the background, definitely. Um, in a sense, uh, I'm just making analogies as we go along. In a sense, this is like dropping links in a system, right? Um, so it would be like saying if, if you partition the system into two parts, it's like you're breaking all the links between the two systems. The analogy being the right brain, left brain, where you have right. corpus callosum and you sever everything, right? So the yeah. idea is you get two distinct systems, right? Yeah, and I think that's the idea of taking the minimum is that, or the cruelest cut is that you're kind of maximally cutting your system such that you have that, you know, like you're identifying the left brain as one bipartition and the right brain as one bipartition and they're highly communicative within each other, but the connections between them are, are looser. Okay. Um, 
I just think it's worth keeping in mind the notion of dropout in machine learning as we go along. It's not exactly the same, but there's this idea of dropping links. Uh, all right, sorry, keep going. Oh, no problem. Um, yeah, so, so, so in general, it's a system-wide measure um, and it represents you know, the, the extent to which the whole of the system is greater than or less than the sum of the parts where the parts are these bipartitions. Um, so here's a really hypothetical, totally made up kind of three node example. Um, so we have X, Y, and Z. And here in the top corner, I'm just saying that, you know, the, the total mutual information um, between all the past values of these nodes and all the future values is three, um, three bits. Um, and then meanwhile, we have chosen this certain bipartition and say that we find this, this mutual information adds up to two bits. Um, so that would basically mean that our integrated information is equal to one bit. So it's just this three minus two. Um, meanwhile, we have other ways that we could have bipartitioned. Um, so we have these other possible, there's only three. So for a, a three node network, there's only three possible bipartitions, um, but they also all have their own value of um, the mutual information of the parts, um, the whole is always the same, right? So this total mutual information is always the same um, whole value. Um, and we get different little fee values. And in this particular case, um, I made one where, you know, this, this last one actually shows a negative value. So it's showing that the, um, the sum of the mutual information of the separate parts is, is greater. Um, which can happen. Um, and so then in that case, we would have chosen that one as the minimum bipartition, and we would have chosen that value as the value of integrated information. Um, and, and what they talk about in the paper a little bit is that the, the negative value, um, they kind of call it like a hampering effect. So like this is one of the problems with the interpretation of integrated information is like, well, what, what is a negative value? Um, and, and a negative value, it's kind of come out more recently, indicates redundancy. So a negative integrated information would mean um, in this, this particular example, um, I think it would mean that this X and Y grouping provides overlapping information along with Z about the whole system. Um, so, so what this paper proposes, um, they're also into information decomposition. So they um, basically kind of apply a preliminary information decomposition to this measure. Um, and information decomposition is a relatively newer concept. Um, I've, you know, been on this for on this train for a while. Um, but basically, it's it's going to blend inform integrated information theory with the ability to decompose information into different types. So information can be shared uniquely um, or individually by variables, synergistically or redundantly. Um, and the hard thing to like wrap my head around here is that there's no source and target. It's the whole network, or I just, it, it needs to be the the past of the whole network is the source and the target is the, the whole network um, of the future. So, so basically this paper proposes a revised version um, which removes the negative redundancy component by adding it back in. So it's considering kind of an alternate measure where we have our original fee um, and then we have this mutual information between the two subgroups. Um, which is equivalent to the um, what's called the minimum mutual information version of redundancy. Um, and this is kind of the most simple possible way to compute redundancy. And they kind of talk about in the paper how they're working on you know, other, other implementations of redundancy measures to potentially do a better job of removing the redundancy. So you end up with a integrated information value that is positive and indicates the um, I guess what would be the synergistic and unique parts of the um, relationship from the um, the past to the future in the network. Um, so that is 
information decomposition. Um, and there's been a lot of interpretations of integrated information. Um, there's also been some different formulations. Not even all of them are strictly information theory based. Um, but this paper gives a couple of them. Um, one is a combination of information modification across multiple parts of the system, information transfer from one part to the other, um, and storage in coherent structures that span multiple variables. So the idea of multiple variables being able to provide more information or more predictive information than just the, um, the sum of them individually. Um, an a alternate definition that I found a little bit more, more tractable is, is in terms of prediction bounds. Um, so it's basically telling us to what extent the full state of the system enables better predictions than the sum of the parts separately. Um, so for example, if you have a really high integrated information or, or fee, we'll just call it fee, um, that means that the more information shared between all the variables, um, that means that there's more information shared between all of the variables relative to any given subset. So if you slice the network in whichever way and you still end up with a high positive fee at the end, um, that would mean that the, the variables really all are interacting coherently and in a way that, you know, you can't just separate them um, and get more information that way. Um, so a little bit of background on kind of how this concept and then the subsequent measure arose. Um, and it was started as a, a theory of consciousness. Um, so here's um, this paper. Um, this isn't even the first, I think it was first introduced in 2004 or 2008. Um, by the same author, um, and basically he, you know, coins it the integrated information theory of consciousness. Um, there's been various iterations of this, mostly by by him and co-authors. Um, I think they're on 3.0 now, so it's like IIT 3.0, um, and it's basically proposed as an approach to understand consciousness, um, and it comes with a bunch of different axioms and postulates, and these are all based on meaningfulness and experiences and you know how do you quantify whether someone is having an experience or whether something is is conscious um and it's basically states that information which they define as the ability to discriminate against large a large number of alternatives um is an essential ingredient for consciousness um and this, this theory, he, he kind of builds it up based on a series of thought experiments to sort of prove that this integrated information should define consciousness. Um, and I'm totally going to butcher this, this thought experiment, but the very first one is basically if you consider a room that can either where you have a light that can be on or off, and you have some sort of diode um, that's detecting, detecting the light condition, so it's a binary type of Thing. So you can set this thing in the room and it'll, you know, turn one when the light is on and zero when the light is off. Um, so that, that's some degree of, of information, right? Um, however, then if you put a person in the room, um, the person can also say, you know, whether it's light or dark, um, but they can also say a million other things um, about the room because they're able to that we, we realize that this entire range of experiences that we could be having, you know, like the light could turn on and there's a blue elephant in the room or there's a chair in the room um, or it's a room with white walls. Um, so there's a lot more alternatives that basically we're discriminating between. So that's kind of an illustration of like our conscious, that, that that's, that's a measurement of our level of consciousness is our ability to discriminate between a larger and larger world of possibilities. Um, so anyway, there's there's a bunch of different axioms. Um, there's a lot of papers behind, behind this, um, but they kind of associate information with things about experiences and how you know, experiences are specific. Um, 
an experience is unified, so we can't we can't reduce an experience to independent components. Um, so you know you see a picture all at once, and you can't just take out pieces necessarily. Um, and every experience is is definite. Um, so a lot of the IIT is is rather um, it's rather philosophical, and there's not actually a lot of like exposition of of the measures, and that's kind of come a little bit later, I think, as you know, proposed toolboxes and ways to actually measure this integrated information. Um, but kind of the the end thing is that they he is basically saying that the value of integrated information um, is consciousness. Um, that's kind of what going this. Back. Oh, go ahead. I was just going back to that. I was just reading those three. Um, if you could go back one page. I think that paragraph had a similar thing, but right. yeah. As far as I can tell, this just means that uh, every permutation of the states is a different thing. That's really all that that says. If you've got, if you've got, uh, um, uh, if you've got two states, then you only got two permutations, zero, one, and one, zero. Well, one, one, and zero, zero. So you got four, four permutations. Well, all that I can tell from these four axioms is basically saying that those are, those four states are unique and meaningful states, right? He says each experience is unified cannot be reduced to independent components. Mm -hmm. That's like saying one 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 is a thing by itself. It's it can't be reduced to one 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 and one. You have to take all four values have to be one for, for that experience to exist. So it it doesn't it doesn't feel to me like he's saying very much more than that. Yeah, um, I, I think I mean. He is, though, in terms of consciousness, um, because so, some of the well, yeah. I'll, I'll get to. You're some saying of that. you're saying that you have four states in that case. If you've got if you've got ten possible things that can take on one zero, you have a much larger number. And if you've got a million, you've got a much larger number, and so on. Um, right, like, like if you if you add in whether there's a chair or not, or whether there's blue right. paint or not or whether there's um an elephant or not so the the chair and the elephant and the paint color plus whether the room is light or dark those are like greatly expanding so, the, the possible right. numbers of so unique ability to discriminate among a large number of alternatives that's basically consistent with the idea that every every possible permutation of the states is is a is an independent specific and definite experience yeah <laughs> okay I, I'm yeah just wondering if there's more than that i, I, I don't see more than that and then yes yeah, so, so, i mean in, in my head it's like it's like um you know the more the more possible ideas you can have is that the more conscious that i am you know it's like if i can imagine if I can like look around my room that I'm sitting in and identify all these things and the temperature and all the, you know, the, the situation that I'm in right now is like a picture and I'm conscious yeah. of that. And like, is, I don't know, is, you know, does Carson come in and he's less discriminatory and he's less conscious because he, you know, doesn't have the same number of like things that he can like notice. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's like saying the picture is a picture only because you see all of the pixels, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, there, there's a lot. Um, you know, there, there, there's a lot of axiom and postulates. This is kind of like one of the main paragraphs from um, one of the more recent versions of of the iterations of integrated information theories. Um, and kind of the the key thing here is that the um. They said that the quantity or level of consciousness corresponds to its irreducibility, and that is integrated information. So that's that cruelest cut of if you take all the subsystems. Um, so just a little bit on, on this. Um, basically, the, the PSC is the physical substrate of consciousness, which is another necessary leap that we have to make, is that the um, our, our ability to measure neurons and synapses and 
neuroscience types of types of variables, um, we have to be able to say that, you know, basically that those are representative of actual consciousness. So they're not just, it's kind of like, um, what is it? The, the fundamental of identity um, states that the quality or content of consciousness is identical to the form of the conceptual structure specified by these things that we're measuring or these things that we, we know are connected. Um, so it's, you know, stating that like this measure that we can take over this you know, network that we have as actual, you know, it, it's measuring consciousness. Um, so um, there's been some, you know, philosophical and practical blowback. Um, there's also been a lot of advances in, in this in terms of, um, you know, doing experiments and things like that. So these are a couple of the examples that the paper provides that are um, some of the, um, they make several different arguments. Um, not against integrated information, but against um, just the direct equivalence between inf integrated information and consciousness. Um, so, for example, um, the main thing in here, um, they state that, you know, information, IIT makes the claim that consciousness can be captured in terms of varying quantities of integrated information. So we must be certain that the thing being quantified is indeed consciousness and not merely integrated information itself, um, which is kind of, um, you know, potentially calling into question that that idea of like, well, how do we know that the the thing that we're measuring is actually, you know, the direct, um, you know, directly translatable to to actual consciousness. Um, so that, that's one aspect. Um, another one of these, this other paper, um, they that's take a the more. With, Go ahead. The pro of course, the problem with all these critiques is nobody has defined consciousness, whereas they have defined integrated information. So yeah, <laughs> anytime um, you raise something, you can say, well, that's not it. Right? Yeah, so, so there's no one that's saying like, oh, I have a better like metric, but they're just saying philosophically, you know, we can't take this measure. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so this other one is basically um, this other thought experiment that's called the fading qualia argument. Um, so it's saying, you know, you have all these neurons in our brain, they're all interacting with each other. Um, and we're slowly replacing them one by one with nanobots um, that perform the same function. Um, and so if the assumption of computational functional functionalism is correct, um, that won't change their conscious experience. So if your brain was replaced by little nanobots, it would say that, you know, you're still equally conscious um, as to what you were before. Um, but then on the flip side, it's kind of like, well, what if not? Um, so what if that's not true? And, you know, your consciousness will kind of fade away as you are increasingly being replaced by, by nanobots. Um, so that, that's another, another aspect. Um, an another aspect that I think the, the authors of this paper have, have brought up is more from a practical side of computing integrated information. You can kind of arbitrarily develop a system which has high integrated information. And the question is like, well, does that mean that that system is conscious? Like, you know, like what, what is it about this data that we just generated that has really high integrated information? Um, or say, you know, we applied this to one of our hydrological models and we would we say that this is conscious? Like, would we, so, so obviously integrated information, it's kind of contextual. Um, so that is some background. Um, so, so what this paper is kind of focused on doing is um, going back to integrated information as the actual metric um, and kind of, taking away the axioms and postulates in relationship to consciousness and just saying, well, this is a measure, this is a useful information theory measure. Um, and what they do is... There should be parentheses on this equation too, right? Yes, sorry about that. Yeah, there's... Um, yeah, the, the, they they pose this as one. They have like a summation here, but I thought it, I wanted to expand it and then I forgot the parentheses, so yes. Um, yeah, so, so they're going back to the core of this as an information theory metric and saying, you know, what does it capture in different types of systems? And particularly their thought is that they can study both dynamical systems and distributed computing systems and use integrated information as kind of a universally applicable measure. 
Um, so their example of a dynamical system um, is a Kuramoto oscillator. So they have, um, they just develop this experiment with eight communities of 32 oscillators. Um, so each of these circles is a community um, and oscillators in a community are, are tightly coupled with each other and the communities are more loosely connected. Um, so you have all of these um, oscillations and they're kind of variably linked um, through this equation where um, the phase evolution of each oscillator is a function of its natural frequency and its connectivity with everybody else. Um, so it has like a natural thing it's doing and then it's kind of variably connected with others. Um, and the thing that's really, um, so this is basically an adjacency matrix. Um, so it'll be a strong coupling for a neighboring guy and then for different neighborhoods, it'll be weaker. Um, and the thing that really changes like the dynamics of this whole system is apparently this phase lag here. So, so this lag at which they're all connected. Um, and so, so this isn't like their finding, but this is just kind of how these oscillators behave um, is that basically you have this, you kind of range from unsynchronized oscillators. Um, they're all doing their own things, um, which is up here. So this beta is like another version of this phase lag. So those are, these are related. So you can kind of think about this going from low to high phase lag. Um, and I do not remember what this, this measure is, but it's like a measure of their positions, I guess. Um, so anyway, you go from a low synchronization state where everybody's doing their own thing to a pretty highly synchronized state. Um, but in the middle is kind of where the interesting dynamics occur is called a metastable chimera. I don't know, how do you pronounce this? Anybody? Um, Chimera. Chimera sounds state. good. Chimera, yeah. <laughs> I just realized I have never said that out loud before. Um, the state where nodes kind of intermittently synchronize with each other and then they go and synchronize with somebody else. So it's kind of interesting, interesting dynamics. Um, so what they do is they basically are comparing several different measures, including integrated information. And they find that integrated information pretty well reflects measures of metastability and entropy. And Metastability, which is um, this lambda, um, is basically a measure of the variance of synchrony over time. So this peak peak value here of lambda is just saying that you have that situation where they're kind of intermittently synchronizing with each other, and that's changing a lot over time. So there's like a high variability of synchronization going on. Um, and then over here, they show that both the both the entropy of the system and the integrated information of the system um, are both sort of reflecting this occurring. It's like this phenomenon here where you have this um, intermittent synchronization state is kind of being detected um, by both of these measures, but they're saying integrated information is more discriminating. So like you can have a broad region of phase lags where you have high entropy, but it's a lot narrower um, where you have high integrated information. So they're saying that, you know, integrated information more specifically pinpoints where you have this phenomenon occurring here. Um, so I think that's basically it for this dynamical system example. Um, their second example is in a distributed computing system. So this is kind of the other, the other side of complex systems um, where it's um, more of a discrete, finite, um, time-stepping type of system. Um, and they use cellular automata. Um, and basically these CAs are where we have a bunch of different agents. They have a finite set of possible states. They evolve in discrete time steps based on really simple rules and whatever states their neighbors are in. So they're kind of reacting, each agent is kind of reacting to its neighbors and then following some, some rule. Um, an elementary cellular automata only has two possible states. So it's black and white or one or zero. Um, and there's a bunch of rules and basically four different possible classes that you can end up with. Um, and this is kind of what I'm not super 
going to be super good at explaining here, but um, basically depending, depending on these rule numbers that each cell has, you can start with an initial condition. So that's this line. So all of these, um, you read this from like top to bottom for each class. Um, you can start with an initial state. There can be an absorbing state. So you can have rules that basically um, just end up with everything being white or everything being black. So that's this class one. Um, class two, you end up with a periodic orbit. So everything is kind of shifting along uniformly at every time step. Um, and then three and four are kind of the more interesting types of cases that you can have where these very like structured persistent patterns start to appear um, out of your random initial conditions. Um, so here what they find is that integrated information increases with that complexity class basically. Um, so you see basically you can kind of use integrated information to um, associate with, with the complexity of, of this system. Um, they also talk about how they can't really discriminate between these two top classes. So it kind of um, peaks and um, asymptotes um, at a certain level of complexity, and they have some reasoning behind that. Um, but they're saying that, you know, integrated information basically successfully identifies the transition to the ability to do more complex computing versus um, these, these types of classes. Um, um, and then they do kind of a second um, second example with, um, so these are different types of cellular automata. Um, so we see some different structures. Oh, let's see. Um, so basically here, this parameter lambda um, represents the fraction of neighborhoods in the rule table that map to non-white states. Um, so as you as you increase it, you get more kind of chaotic. Um, and there's kind of this, again, this like middle intermediate stage where you end up with these kind of interesting branching structures. Um, and this is called Langton's, Langton's Lambda. Um, so here basically they're, they're, they can show that the um, peak fee values, and that should be big fee, correspond to the transition into chaos. Um, and they also show that like the, the variation of where you can have the same lambda and you can either have really high or really low integrated information. That's just saying that different, depending on the system, that the system might jump to the more complex state at a different critical value. Um, so that's what, what that is reflecting there. Um, um, and then finally, the last thing they do is they they look at local information measures, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they are looking at these cellular automata maps, and they're looking at kind of where the information is coming from. Um, so a local information measure is, if you think about your probability density function, um, your measure of mutual information or transfer entropy or integrated information or whatever, it's based on that whole PDF, um, but it's based on a bunch of different values that are taken on each point in your PDF. Um, so the local value of mutual information, for example, is just the, um, instead of, instead of um, the probability distribution function over all the values, it's just the probability of that one point um, in your map. Um, so anyway, they, they do these local information measures. So you're kind of like looking across a line um, and reading reading downward to look at how the system is evolving. Um, and there's these different features in these um, CA systems that are called gliders, which are things that are moving across, um, blinkers, um, which I think are like coming on and off and appearing at different places, and collisions between gliders and blinkers. Um, and basically here, they're just showing that the entropy, the transfer entropy and fee, which is our mutual information um, or integrated information, they're all highlighting these, these features um, within our, our networks, um, which you sometimes can kind of see when you look at the raw, the raw data um, 
but it's kind of hard to see them. Um, so, but it kind of highlights these features that are either moving or blinking or, or doing something. Um, and here their thing is that, that transfer entropy captures the things that are moving. So transfer entropy is capturing the gliders. Um, excess entropy is capturing the blinkers and phi is capturing both. So it's capturing like multiple, multiple aspects of um, information production in the system. All right, so um, in conclusion, basically there, you know, the gist of this paper is that they're exploring relationships between phi and these different aspects or phenomena that pop up in these dynamical, um, different types of dynamical systems. Um, so metastability and phi is the first thing they point out. Um, and here they're linking that to say that the internal variability enables the system to visit a larger repertoire of states. Um, in which system-wide interactions can take place. Um, so that's the case where they have the intermittent synchrony between the oscillators. Um, in terms of phi and its relationship with criticality, um, they're stating that the balance between opposite forces of order and chaos enable certain phenomena to be able to happen. Um, so there's kind of like this middle ground um, and integrated information is and that should just be integrated information, not integrated information theory, um, is maximized by mechanisms that incentivize direct and synergistic information transfer. Um, and then finally, with distributed computation, the capability of information processing complex systems um, to integrate information and their ability to perform information processing kind of comes through these emergent coherent structures, which are the blinkers and the gliders and the collisions and phi captures, captures the existence of those. So when you get a high phi value, it's because like those are, those coherent structures are there. Um, and they, they say that, you know, these things aren't all necessarily related. So, so in terms of other types of measures or non-information theory based measures, you might be able to you might be able to identify something with a measure, but you can't use that same measure to analyze both a dynamical system and a distributed computation system. So they're kind of saying that it's applicable, um, applicable across the board. Um, so, so we can kind of come back to that. Um, the very last thing that I just did this morning um, is that I found that one of the papers by the same author um, actually provides some MATLAB codes at the end. Um, and basically I just applied my little one minute weather station data set um, and I you know, found the integrated information. Um, so I looked at um, one minute weather station data, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, air temperature, Solar radiation were the, the five variables. So I wanted a, I wanted a network with more than four variables. Um, so I looked at three day time windows and, you know, just popped in their function. Um, and, you know, I found integrated information for my, for my weather station. Um, and it turns out that my weather station is not conscious, um, because the integration, the integrated information is negative. Um, it's always negative. And what that means is basically that, you know, there, well, apparently I think what that means is that there's enough redundancy between whatever the maximum partitions are um, that there's always like a separate, um, the, the parts are more, are, the parts are greater than the whole. Um, there is, there, there was a very dominant typical partitioning. So th this particular partitioning kind of always was prevalent. So there were only a few, a few days that didn't follow that particular partitioning. So there were some days when other variables were subgrouped together. Um, we do see like an annual cycle going on. So we see like, it seems to dip during the summer, for example. So it's more highly negative in the summer, um, which is telling us something about maybe how more of the weather variables are synchronized, I think, over the summer. Um, but the big difference in terms of interpretation of this relative to, you know, any other, you know, I've analyzed this data set in eight different ways. Um, there's no source and target here. It's the whole system. So it's, it's, you have to kind of, you can't say, well, what is providing information to what? It's just the total predictability from the past and the future. 
Um, so anyway, that was my that was my fun application. Um, but that is Basically, all. It's... Go ahead. Yeah. Basically, it's saying there's nothing surprising going on. I don't think so. Yeah, it's, it's variable. Because... So there's there's a lot. So, so this sorry this this red line is the smoothed version, just because I wanted to yeah. see you know if there was like an annual cycle going because... on. Because you know, information is described as surprise, right? And integrated information would be some kind of a surprise that occurs um, when you know everything as opposed to knowing only the parts. And so I, I have a question, Alison and Hoshin. Does this mean that your station is very predictable in, 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 in such a way that the surprises are taken away so it kind of boring and you can kind of predict what you're observing no i, I, I think it, oh, go ahead uh, let you talk i was i was gonna say i don't think it means that it's predictable so like it, it just means that it's it's just as predictable knowing relative humidity and wind speed as one left brain and then wind direction and air temperature and radiation are the right brain it's it's just it's more predictable knowing those separately than it is knowing the whole five nodes together. Um, so it's just saying that there's enough redundancy in the system that um, oh, and this is the version of integrated information that's not taking out that redundancy. So this is like the old version of integrated information. So that's why that's why values can be negative. Um, so maybe the interesting thing would be if you you know took out that redundancy information and looked at the other the other aspect which would be the synergistic part um but yeah, yeah they didn't use ahead. the word synergy in their paper right but that's what it sounds like it's like something synergistic is happening and so something new uh and unpredictable uh, something new is emergent which you could not have predicted from knowing the parts you had to take them all together in order for that something new to emerge so so uh if we uh, jump to Hoshin's uh, very early comment, and I think uh, there's a lot to what you said, Hoshin. So let's consider a system of two variables which can only have binary state. Each can have binary state, right? As you said, uh, zero, one, and one, zero. So each variable can have only two states, but the two combined can potentially have four states. And if you go to n, we'll have two to the power n states, right? So by partitioning it, in case of two variables, we're just going to partition it into one and one. That's your uh, only option. And so the question is, this integrated information is trying to figure out to what extent all those four states being exploited uh, together as compared to just individually. So it's possible that you can set it so that if one flips, one is zero, the other is one. And then the only possibility is zero, one combination, right? So all four will never be, they will never have zero, zero, never have one, one. So you only have two of those four states. And in that case, it'll give you some integrated information. But if you allow it to exploit uh, three states, for example, switch one, to one of the variables to one and let the other guy go zero and one. So you're getting one, zero, uh, one, no, it's still doing two. Um, there's a missing, there's something missing here, Praveen, because it's knowing the state at one time and from that knowing the state at the next time that's in the definition. Fair enough. I mean, you can just make it do uh, this thing in time. So the right. issue is there are two components to this. One is how many potential states are feasible yes. and how many of those are being exploited through the combination. And the yes. more, more they are exploited through the combination, the larger you'll have integrated information because then each individual, any subset will not be able to exploit that larger combination, yes. right? I mean, so that's yes. how I am uh, thinking about it. So the cellular automata is actually a, a tailor-made example to illustrate that because what your the cellular automata does, it just changes the state of a cell based on the eight neighboring cells. And uh, so essentially that rule from zero to 255 is essentially 
uh, 0 to 2 to the power uh, 7 uh, potential states, right, 256 states. Or, uh, so, uh, and then th those flippings happen, and in certain rules, basically it will die out, any variability. In certain uh, state rules, this variability is going to come up unpredictably, and there are various patterns that come about. So in a sense, this integrated information is trying to say if, if there are n potential states, uh, to what extent is the system as a whole exploiting those as compared to any subset of that? And it's in every likelihood that thing is going to be larger unless, as I said, there is a redundancy and then some state essentially do what the other state is doing, in which case it's not exploiting the whole uh, space. Right. So that's how Is I'm that, going to understand physically. So it's yeah. possible to do this coin flipping, flipping experiments or die to tossing experiment, Allison, and figure out how, how this uh, goes in there. I, I think you're right. Plus, there's another element which sort of intrigued me, and Allison mentioned it, but it's, it's a little harder to get, get one's head around, is that there's a phase transition, which is a place where computation happens, what we're calling computation. So what do we mean by computation? It means some kind of structured, organized sequence of events emerges, which has a structure of some kind, but it also has this somehow this aspect of computation can happen because you can have many possibilities that you can visit. Um, and uh, so there was a part of it that you didn't really quite get into, Allison, which was about the fact that integrated information peaks at the edge of chaos. You mentioned it, but, and, and they sort of associate that also as the place where computation can happen, so, something like that. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so, I mean, I think uh, this concept have some, has some value. I won't go as far as consciousness at all. <laughs> But that's that's a whole different animal. Uh, uh, but um, there potentially is some value uh, in there. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it's such a lumped measure. So so it's it's you know it's it's combining a lot of it. Well, it's a, well, for first of all, it's a really high dimensional information theory measure. Um, and, and the way that, like, I looked at this MATLAB code because I was like, oh, are they actually, you know, doing something like Peshi and Leila have done? Um, and, and they're not, they're, they, they've they developed some scheme of, like, an estimation of it for both Gaussian and non-Gaussian versions. So this is, like, the non-Gaussian function. Um, so it's, it's very high dimensional. It's very combined. Um, it's, like, you have to want to say something, I guess, about the system as a whole, um, cause you only get one number out, you know, you only end up with one thing and a bipartition and maybe the bipartition is interesting also, um, cause it's a way to kind of like subgroup your system. Um, and, and their okay. os oscillator experiment was not very different from what you were doing with the. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was, um, yeah, not that. That was really logistical logistic maps uh, where you can basically get all kinds of behavior, right? With synchronization and all that stuff. Right, and you can show, you know, you can show that transfer entropy also follows that pattern. You know, transfer entropy shows that also, and you know, the total information between two sources and a target might show something something similar. Um, so it's not like integration integrated information is like the be all end all of information theory measures, um, but it, it is like a, a whole system past to future sort of, um, and I didn't even get into like the time lags. So there's like, you know, you can choose a different time lag to look at the, the values at also. Um, but there's a, um, I mean, Praveen, for a long time, you've been pushing on the notion of complexity, complex systems, and this uh, pattern of the, the different measures, they showed three different measures the integrated information, and then another one which is related to complexity, another one related to something else. They all peak in this intermediate region where um, if you have complete randomness, you have nothing. If you have 
a complete determinism, you have nothing and in the middle, you get this kind of uh, geeking behavior. So it sort of feels to me like these are all different attempts to somehow get an understanding about what we mean by complexity. Um, and it's somehow related to computation, right? It's there's 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 some something that all of these different attempts uh, seem to be pointing towards, where they sort of agree together. But there's some some underlying underlying information processing process that's happening. Yeah, which they seem to be pointing to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. I mean, I think linking complexity to information processing capability is a way good way to think about it. Okay, I have to jump off from this meeting, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll, I'll look at the recording going forward. Um, any, other, any other questions or comments? I just think it would be interesting to see if anybody's pursued relating this to computing. Um, uh, so if you took the same idea and you applied it to a digital computer, you know, what would you get? Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, you've got all these different parts, but somehow they have to function together in order to give you the, the overall behavior of the computer. Right, and people have been arguing that a computer is not conscious, but does it have high integrated information? Yeah, <laughs> it would, um, would be interesting, right? Yeah, there's there's a couple of so, so you know I found this package that you know is like here's how to compute or this paper you know here's how to compute integrated information from time series. Um, one of the other Actually, like the main, like if you look up integrated information theory toolbox, so the original author, the Tononi, um, they also have a toolbox and it's more of a large comprehensive thing. And I realized that what it does, it, it actually needs a graphical network as the starting point. So it needs like a causal, it needs a causal network to start with, and then it computes integrated information based on having all these nodes and the links and, you know, taking links off and like you, you have a link with a direction and a strength. And, you know, if you took one away, it would change the way the network acts. So it was much more of like an interventional type of, um, type of approach. So oh, that was interesting, when but you I you know, don't have that as an example. When you say causal network, you mean you have a network of nodes and links, you start them in some state and you let it go and it evolves on its own? I think so. Um, I'm not really sure. Yeah, like it's it's almost like it's like they've already, you know, what, whatever the data was that they collected, they've already determined like a causal, they've already done that causality analysis of like what's connected okay. to what and how strongly and if you take this away, what will happen to the rest of the network? Um, so it's like not directly just looking at time series data. It also seems maybe it has something to do with the uh, dimensionality of the problem, right? In practice, like if you would need to get it from data, it, it seems that these measures are, because they're comparing two time steps and in your example, five different variables. So that's, I guess, at least a 10 dimensional PDF where it would depend on all the all the structure in it, right? Um, so I guess getting this from data in a practical sense would almost be impossible. Um, but then maybe with a, if you do it from a network, you're already kind of imposing that you're only looking at pairwise interactions and not so, so you're kind of throwing away part of the interactions before starting to analyze. So maybe that makes it feasible to compute anything. Yeah. Um, what was your impression with like looking at this toolbox and putting your time series in? 
<laughs> just that the, the code was way too short. The, the, this is this morning. So I mean, the, the code was way too short to be actually doing any information theory measures. It, it It's doing something about regression. So it, it's like doing something with the combinations and like a regression on different combinations um, of variables. Um, but but yeah, it's like ju just this here, you know, that would have been a 10 dimensional PDF for every for every measure to predict the past or predict the future of five variables on on five past variables. Um, so I'm not exactly sure like what they what they're doing. Um, yeah, and then maybe the it's somehow dependent on how the full joint PDF can split into two marginal ones, right? Or two marginal multi-dimensional PDFs. And right. Yeah. I always this, get a bit suspicious yeah. if the number of dimensions goes above what I can comprehend. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you were talking about the, the causal graphs, it sort of reminded me of what's that model of memory where you start the thing in states and then it settles into the lowest energy state and then that's um, that's considered a a kind of memory representation and then you mm -hmm. perturb it and it can settle into another state huh. and so on sure. it, it felt it felt like you were talking about that Anyway, your oscillator example was probably the most intuitive one. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was a little bit more. I think so. something that Praveen said about the, the 255 rules and like the eight neighbors that like made something click about, about what that part was on the distributed mm -hmm. computing side. Um, I don't think I really fully understand how those are working, but. Um, well, these, Unfortunately, the for the cellular automata, these static pictures don't right, really convey the idea of what's going on because when you watch them evolving, you see structures emerge and disappear and emerge and disappear and so on. I mean, you see gliders, things moving. Across, yeah, yeah, like realizing that things are moving and blinking on and off. And all that kind of stuff. So unfortunately, the static pictures were a little bit... Um, less than informative but mm. uh, have people did you, uh, go ahead did you find anything that uh, did you find anything that this was pointing towards that might be useful to follow up with I don't know, undecided. Um, okay. It was, I mean, it was definitely, you know, I, I looked into this a long time, like when, when I was working on my PhD, it was one of those things that I came across, but I don't think I had it. So, so, so what r really kills me was the dimensionality. So the, like Stephen said, like imagining the probability distribution functions once you get to more than three. And I think that's, a necessary thing and it's like um you know other people have definitely computed those really high dimensional distributions and are looking at more multivariate interactions like this type of this type of multivariate interaction um well i think i think the thing you pointed to about waiting when you compute this so that you're not doing um uh redu you know sort of you just take out one node it's sort of the least interesting cases. You want partitions where you have large numbers of of elements in each partition, and you want. It seems like that would make sense to focus on those as opposed to the other ones, which are kind of like almost uh, circumstantial. Yeah, or you could do that in advance of you know if you really had a node that was pairwise unrelated to every other node, maybe that would be a cause for you to say, well, this isn't really a related, you can remove that dimension maybe. Um, and that would probably not be a bad assumption. Um, yeah. Alison, mm -hmm. to what extent do you think this measure can help us to 
find uh, yeah, a metric of predictability of the behavior of the system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the, like that, that's what this, whoops. Uh, okay, never mind. I just lost my screen share. Um, oh, it went black. Um, in, anyway, like, like the, the value of total mutual information from the past, that, that should be it, right? That, that should be, that should be the total amount of information that all the past variables share with the, the, future and then what you're subtracting for integrated information is the idea of well could you have gotten that same information from like subsets it's just a matter of calculating that i think but but yeah i was kind of thinking like you know your your and Peshi's, um studies where you're looking at the whole causal history it's not, it's kind of like a different version of that sort of, cause you're, you're not picking out different historic time points. You're looking at one same historic time point, but you're looking at the whole network at that, that historic time point um, and looking at, so, so it's not maybe the maximum predictability given all of the different histories, but it's like picking a history, picking a lag and saying like, this is the time lag at which we have to predict the rest of the system. Yeah, I agree. One probable takeaway of this is the recognition of the pairs that are really important to look at when you are trying to predict the behavior of the whole system. So, yeah, as you said, like relative humidity and wind speed being important than the other combination of variables. Um, yeah, which, which can be different at different seasons. And um, yeah, that's interesting. I might do a search to see if there's any work being done on connecting this to the theory of computing. Because um, yeah, that's, seems... that's what I took the most interesting thing out of this paper. It seems somewhat connected to this busy beaver problem where they're trying to find like a very small Turing machine and then going on to create as much chaos as possible, basically, where the, as much uh, the largest number of steps and the largest number of written uh, cells on the tape. Th those well, seem you, to be. Yeah. If you look at it from the point of view that survival requires both a coordinated response and the possibility of many possible responses in, in response to a threat, right? So you would want computing to emerge in such a way that it was not entirely random. It was actually causal and, and responsive or structured to, to some impulse but you wanted it to be, uh, to, to have the possibility of varied responses so that your, um, the other organism can predict what you're going to do, right? Because if the other organism can predict what you're going to do in a two-person game, then uh, you're, you're basically meat, right? So you're food for the other organism. So you need to be able to, construct a, a, an interesting and complex and coordinated response, but it also has to be one which is hard for the other one to predict. And it would seem like that, that that's related to this thing of at the edge of chaos that, that they were alluding mm. to, computing that's at right. the edge of chaos that they were alluding to in this paper. So, so your Turing machine the... needs, to, needs to have that property you were talking about. You know, Stephen, of being able to compute many possible. Uh, in yeah. 
I mean, is that what they call universal computation? I, I've never really looked into what they mean when they say universal Turing machine. I guess that they are able to simulate all others, but that all depends on the infinity of the tape length, right? So a finite tape length can never be truly universal. Um, but it needs so, to be able to simulate as closely as possible all others with a finite tape length. Yeah, I'm not sure if, yeah, in, in that sense, maybe it becomes more a question of computational power, right? That if I'm competing against other intelligence and I want to be more unpredictable, I should be able to simulate what the other is doing and then add something on top of that. So right. I guess the, the most computing power wins. But well, certainly, would... but with the with a fixed amount of computing power and storage, uh, you know, read write space, you would need also to be the most efficient. Yeah. Since every organism is going to be limited by storage and compute power, it has to somehow evolve into a state of highest efficiency. Yeah, whatever that means in this case, survival, I guess. Yeah, and that I think that's somewhat related to this busy beaver problem, like programming mm -hmm. the set of rules that produces like the maximum amount of information with a limited set of uh, with a small set of rules. So, so it's a bit related to this cell cellular automata. But then would that mean that consciousness can only develop if you're competing against other intelligence? Sounds plausible. Yeah. Okay, someone's next, uh, next reading group topic then. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll see what I'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do a search and see if there's anything interesting. I found one which talks about using it in the earth sciences, but I don't know if it's interesting or not. I just mm. downloaded it to look at. But I've been more recently more intrigued in understanding that in order to understand information theory, I'm st now starting to realize you have to understand computing, theory of computing. And in order to understand theory of computing, you have to understand information theory. So it seems like they're really joined at the hip. Um, and I wrote, I, I, did I copy you guys? I ran into this interesting article basically saying, um, uh, asking what's, what's the difference between an equation and an algorithm? Uh, yeah, I saw you shared that. I haven't and it's, read it yet. It's quite fascinating because, because because uh, it it think it it basically talks about an it talks about weak emergence and strong emergence, and it talks about an equation as being something re referring to strong emergence, where um, uh, it's you know it's sort of like you do a lot of computing to compute you do use algorithms, but eventually you you determine that there's a pattern. And that pattern is expressed by the equation. And some equations can be expressed as algorithms, and some algorithms can be expressed as equations, but not all algorithms can be expressed as equations, and not all equations can be expressed as algorithms. So this is an interesting emergent. Uh, so there are two different ways of storing information, basically. One as a process and one as a relationship. And these are meaningful. Um, uh, uh, kinds of information, and so obviously need to be topics of information theory. But they arise in the context of computation, right? And the question is, when do you use which, and why, and how? Huh. That makes me think of my like my undergraduate class as computational methods for civil engineers, and what we're kind of getting into is is. What I'm trying to introduce is, is numerical methods. So we're doing the Euler method, for example, of like a time stepping solution. Um, and the examples that I give are ones that also have or tend to have analytical solutions. So we'll do like Streeter Phelps water quality modeling. There's an analytical equation 
um, you can find the BOD downstream, you know, 25 miles just by like applying this analytical equation. But then I have them do the Euler method version because it's, you know, we, we have also this, you know, D B O D D T um, time stepping equation. And, um, you know, that that's, it's like the Euler method is the algorithm. Um, it's not exactly the same, but it's representing this pro this equation super accurately. Um, so you can get to basically arbitrary accuracy, um, you know, by applying right. this. And I'm just, you know, showing that, well, this takes longer, but sometimes you have to do it this way if you forgot the equation or if you don't know if there's a there's an analytical solution to to do it. Um, or you don't have a you don't know how to solve it explicitly. Right. Yeah, and so, so you have to. Or, you know, this is why we use Euler, or or, right. or if your you channel is integration. not prismatic and this kind of realities, right? Like all these analytical solutions usually make very big assumptions on geometry, mm -hmm. and in other words, they they decide to forget certain things in order to simplify. Yeah, it's like how it's like how did Newton arrive at f mm -hmm. is equal to ma? I mean the classic example is that he had to decide what, what all things to ignore in order to arrive at this very general formulation of a symmetry principle in physics um, and bear it down to its, to its bare essentials. So somehow that's a emergent property. And so what kind of computing, what kind of integrated information processing arrives at something like that. Right? Alisa, I have a question regarding the negative redundancy component when they decide to use minimum mutual information to take that away. Like, I know you have been exploring redundancy information for a long time. So what do you think is their thinking behind using this metric to, for, for re, taking away that redundancy information? Yeah, I don't know. Um, like the, it, it seems kind of simple. It's like, oh, I could just pop in my own measure, you know, or you could just pop in like another redundancy <laughs> measure, but it's, it's the dimensionality that is the problem. So it's, it's like, what I've done is only two sources and one target and they're dealing with, you know, eight sources and eight targets. And it's like, there's a lot of um, sub redundancies within redundancy. And yeah, I, I don't know that. And in the paper several times they're like, we're working on it, right? You know, so, so these right. guys are like a light year ahead of us in terms of like what, you know, like the types of measures that they're, they're trying to employ to quantify redundancy. Um, but yeah, it, it was there pretty... must be some sampling strategies going on because you can't test every possible permutation, right? right. So you must have to bootstrap somehow from that and, and yeah. compute some some average property by sampling a few possibilities from all, all of the possibilities. Yeah, um, yeah, I can't remember like what these guys. Um, these guys also have papers on redundancy, so like on on computing different measures of redundancy. So I think that's what they're like trying to connect it with. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't really remember. Um, yeah, probably it offers um, a methodological advantage of using these for these high dimensional systems, right? And yeah, in the meantime, is what they use while they are developing something else. That's just it. Yeah, that's what, yeah, they're kind of like using it as a, a placeholder to, because it, it is the, it's the maximum possible redundancy. So they're just kind of being super conservative and saying, you know, this is the maximum possible redundancy because that's what that measure is. It's like an upper bound. Um, yeah. On a slightly different topic, it just occurred to me. Because when we did the snow melt modeling across the United States, we found that you could get away with just using 5% of the, the information uh, in order to model the entire system. So in clearly very high level of redundancy, uh, you know, we just sampled 5% of the cells and we were able to extract the, the meaningful structures and then use them to predict the behavior. So in that case, very clearly, 
very low integrated income. Right. It's non-conscious. In the, of, <laughs> in, the, in the sense of this 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 system. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're lucky because if, if Earth would be conscious, we would be in big trouble, I think. <laughs> <laughs> like integrating I don't know. like a tech plan. There is the Gaia hypothesis. <laughs> well, Gaia would be right. pretty pissed off by now, I think. <laughs> we will be the lead of the use a race of the equation. And, yeah. Have you haven't you noticed how hot it's been getting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it kind of does like just just the um the background with the consciousness does kind of make you like look at the measure and <laughs> be like, well, you know, if you were looking so, at a brain data, you might say, oh, that's consciousness. But then if I'm looking at my weather station data, it's like a joke of whether <laughs> like whether or not it's conscious. <laughs> But I think, but I think I, I agree with the paper that you know consciousness is is great. It's an interesting topic, but it's a bit of a red herring. The real issue is synergy, right? Um, is the emergence of something that is more than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. That's really what all of this stuff is talking about. And um, so I think as long as we keep that in center focus, uh, all of this stuff is interesting and makes sense. Yeah. Because regardless of whether it's conscious or not, that's a matter of definition, and definition doesn't exist. But we do have a sense of what we mean by synergy. Yeah, yeah the critiques call it the hard problem of consciousness. So it's like a unbounded. Um, yeah, you can't just. I mean, and argu arguably, here's the question: Can a uh, does Gödel, does Gödel's theorem apply here? Right. Can a human can human beings, even as a collective, understand consciousness? Right, because it's sort of like you're inside the system; you're not outside the system. Yeah. So you know we're defining something, and then we're not. I mean, we're we we we're, we're claiming a state, but but we're not but we're not able to define it, and it's not even clear that we can define it. Um, so all that we can do is study a system by breaking it into parts and see juxtaposing one part against the other, and then kind of project what the entire thing might possibly be doing. But there's no way to verify it because because you always have a part looking at a part. So so that argument might ultimately be sort of meaningless or irrelevant. <laughs> Um, Seems like a and good take. The real question is, can I create using other parts of the universe something which can function at a higher level of intelligence or whatever you want to call it than I can? Yeah. In the sense of winning the survival game. <laughs> I think. And that, that doesn't seem too far-fetched. No. But you don't even need to define consciousness to do like you just need to have something that senses and uses resources to, to so to to capture more resources in the universe and competes with right. you right but 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 let's 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 put a human being on one side of the table and let's put a hypothetical artificial intelligence machine intelligence on the other side of the table. And let's postulate that each one of these believes that it is unique and special and conscious. What would that debate look like? Right? Because each one from its own perspective believes that it is superior to the other in some sense, but that's a, that's a tautology, right? That's a definition. When we when we claim we're consciousness, we're we're basically implementing a tautological definition by saying we can do this. And yeah. so, what would that debate look like? That might be an interesting. It's even if you put two humans uh, opposite each other, right? One might that, believe that, that would be they a place are, to start, right? That they are in a simulation and the only conscious person <laughs> present. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's like my, you know, you could argue about which of us are the most conscious, you know, like yeah. which of us are having the. 
the deepest yeah. thoughts and seeing things the most clearly and but, see, but that's the point is now you said conscious and then you start defining it in terms of thoughts and seeing clearly and this that and the other yeah or you know or am i right you know are you wrong or right and is that part of right. being conscious so we've got words in the language like love and and compassion and you know and so on and so forth all of which are very um abstract they're so abstract that um they, they cannot be uh uniquely pinned down right you have to use a lot of other words to describe those words and we did this exercise once at a tony robbins workshop where they gave us five or ten words and everybody had to sit down and write ten synonyms for that word but like take the word love and you write down ten synonyms and, and you look in, in the group of, of people and hardly anybody had the same synonyms synonyms for the same for the same word right so everybody's understanding of that word was in some sense different but if you and i steven were in the room and we were the humans and two other machine intelligence were in the rooms and they were the machines there's a possibility that you and i would decide we're humans because we've just decided we're humans we don't you know what makes us human? We, we don't even know that, right? Um, we would just we would just decide that because of our commonalities, we're going to be on one side of this game, and the other ones would decide because of their commonalities, they'd be on the other side of the game. But really, means nothing more than we've decided. You know, I could decide that because I can solve math problems and this computer can solve math problems that we're on one side of the table, yeah. and because the other one, because the human can do art, and the other machine can do art here on the other side of the table. It's, it's so completely arbitrary. Hmm. Let's talk again in 20 years. <laughs> anyway, if anybody finds anything of this related to theory of computing um, or information theory and theory of computing, I would really appreciate it, sending it my way because I think, I think, uh, I think it, I think it's very, useful for us to try to understand take you know information theory when we learned it it was a bunch of metrics right based on probability distributions and so on and so forth but as we dig into what is information and how does it relate to models and earth science and so on i clearly see the connection to algorithms and the different kinds of information how we how we store and process information and so on I think it was very useful to read Chiara Marletto's book because, you know, I now feel comfortable that information is grounded in a physical substrate. You have to have a physical substrate that can take at least two possible values. You know, so it's, it grounded us in that thing. And the fact that a physical substrate and two possible values is also part of the grounding of the theory of computation, basically. So, it feels to me like there's a common core ground there. And uh, so anything you guys run into which which throws more light on that would be interesting to pursue, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah, sounds good. All right, thanks, Alison. Yeah, great. no, thanks for, thanks, Layla, for organizing. Thanks, Alison. Oh, Alan. before we go. The other paper that you, the other paper that you had put us the two, what what was that about? Just oh, I don't even remember. Or... Um, okay, it was just it, it was one that Praveen had had popped up on there. Um, I don't know if you remember, Layla. Um, it was it was not integrated information, but I think that's how I found this one. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I don't remember what the okay it was something multivariate some sort of multivariate mutual information type of type of thing. Um, yeah, there's another guy on the internet called Josh Chapak, and he apparently has some strong opinions about, he's a, he's a computer scientist, he's in computation as opposed to a neuro, neuroscientist in, into neurology, you know, and so on. So he's not talking about consciousness, but he has some interesting critiques of information, integrated information theory. But I can't tell you what they are just yet. I'm trying to understand what he's what he's talking yeah. about and again he comes at this from the point of view of everything is computation so 
anyway, thanks, guys. All right. See y'all. Bye. Bye.